Let me ask you something. Lean back for just a minute. Try and be honest. You don't have to look at anyone else. Keep the lights kind of low. But in the privacy of your own heart, if you could change just one thing about you, what would it be? And if you could change one thing about how you look, how you think, how you respond, if you could change one kind of private struggle or something that just you feel like, you know, you've made progress, but it just keeps coming back at you, if you could revamp it, have a makeover, modify it, literally revolutionize something down deep inside your life, what would it be? In fact, maybe more importantly as we start this series is, do you believe that life change, I mean real life change, not just exterior stuff, can really happen? Do you believe that lifelong addictions or things that happen out of maybe a family of origin, a dysfunction, or fears and struggles and just kind of the way you are that you've just said, you know, I guess this will never change. Do you really believe that God can and will change that in ordinary followers of Jesus Christ like you? See, the Bible teaches and God promises that when a person is born of the Spirit, and if that person born of the Spirit lives in vital union with Christ, that he will so radically change you from the inside out that if someone knew you today and then met you 10 or 15 years later, there's parts that they would just say, it's hard to believe you're the same person. It's not just some cleaning up on the outside. There's a fundamental change that happens when Christ enters your life and the Spirit of God is allowed to have control and as you connect with other people and His Word begins to birth the very life and personality in Jesus in you. God promises, He actually commands it. The Scriptures declare it. And, and nature sort of gives us a, an object lesson. I want you to watch the next 30 seconds and you're going to see a picture of what we learned in biology class is metamorphosis. But I think it's the greatest object lesson because you see a little green caterpillar, stage one, who goes into a cocoon or a chrysalis, stage two, where you can't see what's going on, and emerges, stage three, as a beautiful monarch butterfly. There's a reason God put that in nature because it is a snapshot of what he wants to do in every human heart. Watch this and think about you. Now, that was obviously very high-speed photography. That happens uh, over a period of time. And actually, the period of time, a little egg is laid on a milkweed plant. And uh, that egg hatches after about 10 days. And then for the next two weeks, the only thing that that uh, little green caterpillar does is eat, 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 eat. And then for about two weeks, it creates this cocoon. And you don't know what's going on, but amazing changes. I mean, that green caterpillar and butterfly have the exact same DNA but there's transformation. It's called metamorphosis. If you pull out your teaching notes, meta means to be transformed or change. Morphosis has the idea of substance or structure. In fact, Webster says metamorphosis is a change of a physical form, structure, or substance. And then I love this, especially by supernatural means. Especially by supernatural means. That's the picture. That's normal Christianity. 
That's what happens when the Spirit of God comes into the human heart of a person who has been forgiven of their sin. They're born again from above, and that's the journey or the process that occurs. Now, there's a problem. And the problem is that we all long to change and improve and grow and be transformed, but we find it really difficult, right? I mean, there is a multi, multi billion dollar self help industry, especially this time of year. Are you like sick of the commercials? I mean, every commercial, depending on what they're advertising, there's a before and then there's a after. And so, I mean, if I have PX whatever, or I have insanity, or if I have total gym, or if I have, I mean, on and on and on and on, then I'm going to have a body like that. And then, of course, Jenny and Weight Watchers and Nutrisystems, and I mean, we're bombarded by what? I used to be like this, but for 1995, instantly, take this pill and you will And whether it's diets or fitness or advertisements of recovery programs for addictions or anger management, there is something in us, especially if we can't sleep at night. About 2.30 a.m., I can tell you these infomercials will flood the waves of your home. And there's something now and then where you kind of lean forward and think, you think if I ordered that it would really work, right? You know? I mean, just, it looks, uh, lady, she just took that pill. She didn't change her diet. She didn't work out. And wow, she looks good in that bikini. All for $19.95. There's something in you. God made you and made me with the DNA. You want to change. You want to grow. You want to improve. But quite often, it's not only hard, it doesn't work. Statistically. Even people who lose a lot of weight, statistically, most all of them gain it back. Statistically, the people who do the fitness program and really get in shape, statistically, they actually get back out of shape very quickly. Statistically, those who go through recovery programs for alcohol or drugs, the great percentage of them have relapses. And sadly, statistically, People who come to know Jesus Christ as their personal Savior after some incremental beginning changes rarely live like Christians. According to Barna, according to Gallup, and probably according to the anecdotal evidence we have in our own life. So we got a picture of what God wants to do. We've got a problem. And what I want to talk about is a process of spiritual metamorphosis. I mean, why is this? What, what's the problem? Why don't we change? What is it that we don't understand or that we're not appropriating? God has given us everything we need to be completely transformed. It is a process. It is a journey. But I'm going to suggest that most people don't understand the process. They don't understand the journey, and you don't have the tools. And that's why a lot of Christians don't live like Christians. And so, notice on your notes, I'm going to give you an overview, and some of this is like core theology of the Bible, and I wish I could spend more time, but this is like session number one, and I pray in the back of your mind you'll say, you know what, for the next five weeks, unless I've just got to travel out of town for business, I need to be here, because what you're going to learn, and what you're going to learn how to apply, is how the little green caterpillar of your life, wherever you're at, in a very specific process of a cocoon that we'll talk about that God's created will cause transformation where some of those things that I ask you about you changing, God wants to make you a a spiritual monarch butterfly with amazing beauty and change you in ways beyond what you could really think possible would happen to you. But you need to know the process. Stage one in the Christian life in spiritual metamorphosis goes like this. There's a spiritual birth. Jesus gives me a new life. The Bible calls this, the moment that happens, justification. It's a legal term. In John chapter 3, a religious leader came to Jesus and said, 
We know that you're from God by the works that you do. He was religious. He knew the Bible. But Jesus said, unless you're born again, unless you're born of the Spirit, unless you're born from above. In other words, physical life requires a physical birth. Spiritual life requires a spiritual birth. It's not an intellectual thing of agreeing with God about certain doctrines or teachings. It requires a spiritual birth. At a certain day, at a certain time, you need to realize that Christ died upon the cross in your place, that he rose from the dead, that he's paid and covered your sin and the sins of all people and all time, and the Spirit of God will convict you that you are separated from God, and you will turn from your sin and in the empty hands of faith, ask Christ to come into your life and forgive you. And at that moment, God as legal judge justifies you. Some of you have heard the definition, it's just as if you didn't sin. And that's true, but it's only half the story. The moment you're justified legally, here's what happens. Imagine, if you will, a, a little computer screen on this side, and it has your name on it. And a little computer screen over here, it has Jesus' name on it. And on your computer screen, the moment you're justified, you have your righteousness, which is as filthy rags. And you have all your sins like I have all my sins. And justification, God does two things. One, he deletes the sin column, and he takes it, and he puts it over on Christ. So all your sins are paid for by what he does. And then he takes the righteousness of Christ, and he pushes share, and he brings it over here, and he imputes it onto your column. So when the God of the universe looks at every child of God in terms of your position and your legal standing, he sees you with the very righteousness of his son. Not understanding that is why many Christians' lives never change. And so we've turned Christianity into moralism and trying hard to please God or imitating Jesus' behavior. When what you're going to learn is a spiritual birth occurs and the Christian life is living out of who you already are. The second phase is spiritual growth. This is called sanctification. I put these words in here very purposefully. I think for the last 20 years, we've tried to make everything so simple. We don't teach people some basic theological language. Sanctification, the word literally means to be separate. All those verses where it says, be holy, be sanctified, it's sacred. This is the same root word. This is not just a moment in time. Notice this is Jesus changes me to be progressively more like him. You often hear this as progressive sanctification. If any man is in Christ, the Bible says, the old things pass away, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Behold, listen to the tense of the verb, all things are becoming new. Justification, therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God, new relationship. Sanctification, Therefore, if any man, any woman is in Christ, new relationship, the old things are passed away, behold, process, all things are, are becoming new. It's a journey. We're going to talk about the journey. In fact, this whole series is about spiritual growth, that journey, and how it works. The third phase is spiritual maturity, and the word here is glorification. That word maturity, it's, it's everywhere in the Scripture. Jesus would say in Matthew chapter 5 in the Sermon on the Mount, verse 48, he, he summarizes the point and says, be ye perfect, that's this word, even as your heavenly Father is perfect, which you're thinking, whoa. Or the Apostle Paul would say, the goal of all his life was we want to present every man, every woman complete or perfect in Christ. Uh, James 1 will open up and say, the whole goal of difficulty and pain is we endure and we go through it that we might be perfect or complete. The word is teleos, and I, I say that just so you hear. Do you hear sort of like telescope? Or for you apologists, it's the teleological argument. The word means is that something, it's by design, and the design has a fulfillment. And what God is saying is the fulfillment of your design when you come in to be a Christian is he's going to make you like his son. And 1 John 3, 2 says, we do not know, little children, what we will be like, but this is what we know. When we see him, Jesus, we will be like him. And so all those verses about be mature, grow to maturity, it starts with justification, a point in time, a journey of sanctification, and then there's one day when you will achieve maturity, you will actually be like Christ and be transformed. That's the spiritual life. 
question then is this just for like superstars? I mean, is this people that just make it into kind of the Christian Hall of Fame or a handful of pastors or missionaries? And around here we talk about maturity being very clearly defined as becoming a Romans 12 Christian, right? And in verse 1 of Romans 12, we know it's being surrendered to God. And then verse 2 talks about being what? Separate from the world's values. And notice in your notes, what's it say? Look at the bottom, Romans 12, 2. And do not be conformed to the pattern of this world, but be transformed, circle that word, by the renewing of your mind. Didn't say by trying hard. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. And then notice the result. Notice what God wants for you, what he wants for me, what he wants for every follower. That you might, literally the word is that you might test or experience or know by way of real experience the will of God. That which is good, acceptable, and well-pleasing or perfect. You know that word transformed, it's, are you ready? Metamorphosis. Now, that's God's goal for all of us. And I think the issue is if that's God's goal, if that's God's agenda, I like to call it, it's the miracle of life change. It's about transformation. What we're going to do beginning now and for the next five weeks, we're going to talk about how it really works and how you can experience it. Turn your notes, if you will. Ephesians chapter 4, the entire chapter, is about how this really works. Ephesians chapter 4. The context, of course, are you ready for this? Is Ephesians chapters 1, 2, and 3. So, for three chapters, he's told us, this is what God has done for you, doctrine. Chapter 4, 5, and 6, this is how you live in light of what he's done. But before we even open it up, open your Bible. Will you, Ephesians chapter 4, there's a, a Bible in front of you. In chapter 1, he said that you've been adopted. He said that you've been chosen. He said that every spiritual blessing and all of all the world in heaven is yours. He says that you're a part of a family. He says you have an inheritance. He says you've been sealed with the Spirit. He says you've been made part of a supernatural family. I mean, everything you need, you already possess. You are in Christ. And at chapter 3, then, he prays a prayer. And please don't miss this prayer. Glance, glance in your Bible. Go up to about verse 14, 15. And when Paul looks back on all that God has done for you and me and every Christian, he says, for this reason, I bow my knee before the Father, who's the Father of all the families of all the earth. And he goes, here's what I'm praying for you. I'm praying that God would strengthen you in your inner man, down deep in your heart, that you would be able to grasp the height and depth and length and breadth and to the know the love of God that's beyond understanding. That his love, you would begin to grasp not how hard you need to try, but you could grasp that chapters 1, chapters 2, chapters 3, all this truth is really just an expression that you, totally apart from anything you've ever done, you are so deeply loved. You're accepted. You're forgiven. You, you've got a purpose. He's given you a gift. He's prepared a place for you. He's for you. And then chapter 4 is going to open up, and notice what it says. He says, as a prisoner of the Lord then, you know, in light of that, I urge you to live a life worthy of the calling that you've received. Well, how? Be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. And then he says, well, why? Well, there is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called in one hope when you were called. There's one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. And, and what he's going to do in these six short verses is explain to us now that you are justified, I'm going to explain to you how that spiritual green caterpillar gets transformed into a butterfly. And I'm going to explain the part that God does, and I'm going to explain the part where he asks you to cooperate. And so notice, in verse 1, he's going to say the call is to let Jesus live his life through you. Notice it says, as a prisoner of the Lord, then in your, in your notes, I urge you to, will you put a line under, live a life. 
live a life. We're to live a life, and above that, write the word walk. This is a very good translation, but it's a metaphor. And he's really saying, I want you to walk worthy of this calling that you receive. Well, what calling? The calling of chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3, you've been chosen, you've been placed in the body of Christ, the Spirit dwells in you, you've been called into a group of people called the church, a supernatural body, you've been called with the purpose, you're loved. Now he says, what I want you to do is I want you to walk worthy. And maybe right below the word uh, worthy, you might write the English word axis. The, the literal meaning of the word, it, was, it comes from, uh, you know, when they would measure things with scales like this, the literal meaning of this word means bring up the beam to the other side to make it level. And so, you know, if you were going to buy something, they would put, you know, like so much food or so much grain, and they would put so many weights over here, and that would tell you how much it cost. And what the Apostle Paul is saying, for three chapters, you're loved, you're forgiven, you're cared for, you're a part of a body, you have a future. Those are all the things you now believe and you possess. Now, let your behavior reflect your beliefs. Let your conduct say the same thing as your creeds. Let you, what you profess and what you practice tell the same story. Let what your lips say are true come out of your life. Basically, what he's saying is, this is not about trying harder. He says, you are in Christ now. Here's the command. I call you to let Jesus have full freedom and reign to live his life through you. That's the call. Well, how do you do that? How does it work? Now, if you grew up in the Christian circles that I grew up in, and, and they didn't do this intentionally, if this verse was not in the Bible, here's what I learned. Okay, you want to live the Christian life? Well, read your Bible more, come to church more, pray more, give more money, go on a short-term missions trip, and then there's five or six other things if you really get going. In other words, it was about do, 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 activity, 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 activity. And so I did. I tried all the activities. And I remember doing all the activities for two years, and I just got worn out. And, and yes, some external things changed, and I got involved in some groups. And, but boy, some internal things and some attitudes and some issues of lust and materialism and pride and things that people didn't see. I found I was do good, do good, try hard, fail. Do good, do good, try hard, fail. And then after about two years, I just said, sort of try good, do good, and fake it. And I'm not sure, but I think that's a lot of Christians. I think, you know, you get to some real things that really need change, like arrogance and materialism and, and lust and comparing yourself with others and pleasing people and workaholism. I mean, you know, after a while, you can sort of figure out either how to mask it or, you know, stop cussing or looking like a pagan. And so we sort of clean up the, the general stuff. But what, how do you actually... How are you radically transformed where it's out of beauty and life and grace? Notice what he says. He says there's a process. And he says the process isn't about duty and activity, it's about relationships. By the way, those relationships done later in a way that you understand, to fulfill this are good things. Don't get me wrong, it's not wrong to read the Bible or pray or those things. But I'm just saying there's a lot of Christian activity that doesn't make you more Christ-like. Ask the Pharisees. He says the process is to practice sacrificial, other-centered relationships. He says be completely humble and gentle. Be patient, bearing with one another in love. Make every effort not to gain, but to keep the unity of the Spirit through the bond of peace. He says, remember, I just told you in chapter 3, Jew, Gentile, brand new church, you're connected. You all actually are an organic revolutionary group that God in his sovereignty has produced. I want you to make every effort so that your relationships and how you love one another demonstrate what's already true. Now, with your pen, pull it out if you will. I want you to put a line under the word humble and write number one above it. Put a line under the word gentle and write number two above it. Put a line under the word patient and put number three above it. And then put a line under bearing with one another, because that's all one word, actually. Put a four above it. 
And then put a box around, make every effort, and write the number five below it. Humble. Literally, he's saying, I want you to live out this new faith. And so, first and foremost, get an accurate view of yourself, not too high, not too low, but in relationships, you put others and think of others as more important than yourself. And then not only be humble, I want you to be gentle. The word means considerate. Jesus uses it of himself as in power under control. It was used in the ancient Greek literature as a, a wild stallion that was very powerful and it was broken and would have a bit in it. And now you had this massive power, but it was under control and was useful. And Jesus calls himself gentle. This is not weakness. And at the core of gentleness is not demanding your rights. And so I'm going to put others first. Uh, by the way, are you starting to feel like you can't do this? There's a reason why this is the command. You're placed in relationships where unless you draw on Christ's power, this is impossible. You can't fake this stuff. And so I put others first and have an accurate view of me, and then I don't demand my rights as I put them first. And then when that happens, what, what happens? They make you nuts. I mean, this happens like in real families and in Bible studies and ministry teams and, and Christians that we know that we want just a little of their time, not too much. And so the next word is we're to be patient, macro thumus, macro to spread out thumus heat. They're spreading out your passion. The word means to be steadfast, to have a long fuse, to hang in there with people when they, they literally make you nuts. And you would think this is enough in relationships. He's talking about a way that people treat one another because Jesus lives in you. He's really saying, what's it going to look like when Jesus manifests his personality and power through you in your most intimate relationships? Humility, gentleness, patience. And then the next one is like, come on, God. He says, bearing with one another, literally the phrase means to put up with the idiosyncrasies and things that other people bring into your life that make you crazy. And you do it in love. Can, do you understand the change that happens in your life when you're in an environment where you're receiving other people put you first and people don't demand their rights and there's not ego, but they're gentle with you and you have struggles and you share and you're a little bit vulnerable and in your struggle you actually meet someone whose body language doesn't say, you know, when are you going to get with the program? And instead, they're patient. And then we all have idiosyncrasies, right? I mean, we really do. We have personality ones. We have behavior ones. And what it's like when someone kind of sees who you really are. I remember the first time this happened, and I made this big confession, you know. You know, I think I have this idiosyncrasy. And I remember the guy turned to me, he goes, I've known that for three or four years. I still love you. And it was one of the most profound experiences in my life because, you know, I came to this moment of, you know, I'm really quirky in this area. And he just went, duh, like everyone knows that but you, Chip. <laughs> and, and then there's a, this word of intensity, make every effort. It's a, it's a picture of an athlete straining. It's, it's, it's given the word is it will be done in a context of difficulty. It's whatever you got to do to make it happen. In the Silicon Valley, it would be like this. You know that little chip that someone made and there's a deadline and there's quarterly reports and we're not quite sure, but you know, we're going to have to give our earnings over here and you got three and a half weeks. And it's like, if you have to be there all night at your jobs and we make this happen and we land this Thing, it happens here, right? No matter what. That's this word. It's that level of intensity, but what for? To keep, not to gain, not to create something, but to actually experience the unity that we have. And so he calls you and he calls me into these attitudes, four specific attitudes, one, two, three, four, humility, gentleness, patience, and this bearing with one another, and one action, number five. Make every effort. One action. Listen very carefully. You might even write this down. Green caterpillars are transformed in cocoons or pupa. Christians are transformed in community. 
the reason many Christians who genuinely have come to Christ, who honestly love God, who have some initial outward changes and a few inward ones, and then plateau and never deal with the deep, deep issues of the heart, dysfunction, family of origin, fears, rejection, workaholism, all the things they pass on to friends and kids. The reason those deep issues never change is they are not in community where the real them shows up meeting real needs for the right reason in the right way and where they are vulnerable and someone loves the broken parts of you and loves you enough to encourage you and accept you and at the same time hold you accountable and not let you keep being the same person. See, it's the Jesus inside of their body extending the love of Christ. And Jesus' love is always soft and tender and sometimes very hard and tough, depending on what we need. Because his goal is the outcome, not just that you feel good. And so he says, this is how transformation works. Justification, this is what God has done. Sanctification, you start on a journey. The journey is first my beliefs and behaviors. It is an oxymoron for a person to come to Christ and their life not change. I mean, it's just unheard of in Scripture. Only in America and around the world now could we ever create this world where a Christian is someone who comes to meetings, intellectually acknowledges that Jesus is a Savior that died and rose from the dead, and we tip him with a few hours of our day and our week, and we live our life completely differently and say, this is working. So he calls us, let his... Life live in and through you. Isn't that different from trying really hard to act like Jesus? Isn't that different from, I'm going to try and quit cussing, and, and, and then I'm going to try and be more generous, and, and then I'm going to quite treat me so, 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 so selfish, and, and then pretty soon, because we know how a Christian is supposed to act, I think a lot of us, and let me start with me, in seasons of my life, I've spent more energy appearing loving and appearing Christianly than I really was just so that the other people would think I'm making progress. This is getting way too convicting. Let me get back to my notes. <laughs> there's a reason, however, and the reason is really critical. He says there's one body, one spirit, just as you were called in one hope, that you were called one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father. Uh, every time the word one is used here, could you underline that? There's seven of them, so let me give you a minute. One, 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 one. Uh, where it says there is, where you put a box around there is because, and again, our English Bibles are absolutely fantastic, but just now and then, uh, the Greek text is there in a way that's a little bit more in living color. The, the there is isn't in the original text, but it makes the sentence make sense. Because what Paul has done is used a very unusual grammatical device. And basically what he's saying is, three chapters of all that God has done for you. Therefore, walk in a manner worthy. Let your life and lips tell the same story. Here's how to do it. Get together in deep, authentic community and treat each other with humility and gentleness and patience and put up with stuff. And, and the only way you'll do that is draw on his resources. And then literally he goes off. There's seven staccato words, bam, 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 bam. It's like you've got to understand how important this is. And this is so important. It's not about your happiness. It's not, a, it doesn't work for you. It's not that it improves your life. He's going to do seven staccato, one, 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 and then you'll notice there's four alls. All, 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 all. There's a focus of unity. There's a focus of consistency. And then he does something where it's in triads. There's three ones followed by three ones followed by another three ones. And, and the Trinity is in this. And usually we think of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But he doesn't go that direction. It's very unusual. He's talking about the church. He's talking about what Christ has done. He's talking to them and to us about this transformation. And so he starts with, well, how does it work? The Spirit of God is what convicts us. The Spirit of God is what gives us spiritual birth. We're born of the Spirit. The Spirit of God is our pledge or down payment for heaven and our hope. And so notice what he does. They, these are, I mean, when they're reading this, I, I can imagine them opening the scroll and going bam, 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 seven times. And basically what it goes, there's one body, the church, one Spirit who creates it, and one hope. You're the new church. The Spirit does it. He's taking you to heaven. 
And then for what? Who's the focus? One Lord Jesus, one faith, one baptism. Jesus is the focus of it all. Each one of you have taken this step of faith, and each one of you have graphically, publicly told the world and said, your past is behind you, and you got wet publicly. And what you did is you said, my old life died, and I've been resurrected with him. And all the privileges and all the persecution, think about when this was written. I'm going to walk with him. There is one Lord. This was written when there was a God on every corner. There's one Lord, one faith, one baptism, and then it goes to the Father. There's one God, but he's different than this God that makes everyone afraid. Notice there's one God. He's the Father. He's kind. He's a dad. He's an Abba. He's the Father of all, and then notice he's sovereign. He's the creator. He's what? Who is over all and through all and in awe. And so he gives them this extraordinary, high, lofty view of who God is. And in essence, listen carefully. Here's what he's saying. This is what God's done for you, chapters 1 through 3. Here's the command. Let him live his life through you so that your behavior and your lifestyle match what's true. The way to do that isn't about activity or do's and don'ts or external rules. It happens in community, in deep, authentic relationships where you give to people what you really don't have to give, and so you draw on dependency as you abide in Christ and you love others. In fact, the way Jesus loves people, he, he, he gives you a moment with His Spirit. He speaks to you through His Word. But the way Jesus is going to hug most of us is you're not going to get like, you know, an angel from heaven at the foot of your bed tomorrow morning going, hey, I need a hug. He's going to hug you through me. He's going to hug me through you. It's going to be the person in your small group. It's going to be the Jesus living in this body. And he says, as you do that, do you remember what Jesus said? The way the world will know that the Father has sent the Son is what? by the authenticity and the genuineness of our love for one another. And Paul says, that's what at stake. Now, we're going to be on a journey, okay? So I, I can't cover, your, most of you are thinking you've already covered too much, your head hurts. <laughs> but what I want to do before we go on is I want to give you the three reasons as you flip this text around and when you look at people's life experience, I want to give you some practical tools about, so what, what keeps us from metamorphosis? What, what are the barriers for all of us? And you know, as I go through this, and I mean, don't get covered over with, oh, that's me, I'm a terrible person. No, no, no. God brought us here to say, let's go on a journey. If most Christians understood justification and sanctification and how it worked, most Christians would look a lot more like Jesus. And so let me give you these three things. I'll give it sort of top level, and we're going to be unpacking these for the next five weeks. Three reasons we fail to be transformed. Reason number one is spiritual ignorance, N not stupidity. I I'm, this isn't that people are stupid. We just don't know. Our failure to understand our true identity in Christ destines us to the try hard, do good, fail syndrome. The problem is a lack of knowledge. The solution is discover your new identity. I mean, for, I, I didn't know. I kind of grew up in a, in a church that didn't preach the Bible, and I became a new Christian, and the Spirit came into my life, and I got around a group of people that were really activity-oriented, which was good. And so I tried hard, do good, failed, try hard, do good, failed, try hard, do not so good, fake it. And then I quit trying. I remember I was a Christian just about a year and a half or two years, and I had this poster. It was in college. And I had a poster and I had my Bible there, and it was some poster about God. So when people came in my room, you know, hey, you know, yo. You know, <laughs> he wasn't there yet, but it, it was my Tebow moment. And, and I remember like, okay, some things changed. And then it was just... You know, I was playing basketball and baseball, and I was an RA. And in my private moments, I realized lust had not changed. My ego really hadn't changed. I was now reading the Bible, and I didn't want to be a hypocrite, and I knew I was. 
I, all I knew was I was trying as hard as I could in my energy to be like Jesus because I thought that's what a Christian was. And I got news for you. You can't do it. No one can live the Christian life but Jesus. And the way the Christian life is lived is when we abide in relationship and the Spirit of God takes the Word of God in the context of the cocoon of community and He produces the life of Christ. We have a part. Make every effort. But if you don't know how it works, you can try really hard. And so you have to discover your identity in Christ. I'll give you one verse to get you going and maybe a couple resources. Galatians 2.20 is the Apostle Paul in one sentence saying, if you don't understand the Christian life and you want to know the identity of Christ's truth, here's in one sentence. If you want the longer version, read Ephesians 1, 2, and 3. If you like a more technical version, read Romans 6, 7, and 8. But let me just give it to you. I mean, you know, this is the elevator pitch on your identity in Christ. Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives within me. And this new life that I live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. See, Paul realizes when he trusted Christ, he died with Christ. His old man died. He was resurrected with him. He's living out of who he already is. And yet he's saying, I I still live in this world. But yet not I, but it's Christ lives in me. And the way you appropriate grace, the way you experience the truth of Ephesians 1, 2, and 3, it's a faith walk through grace. That's why the metaphor of walk is so important. I, uh, I'm starting to feel like I'm old. I want you to know I'm not really old. But I'm feeling that way with my ninth grandchild on the way. I started very young. And Teresa started even younger. But I can tell you from when my kids were small and now with all these little grandkids, can you remember what it was like when you saw children learn to walk for the first time? Do you remember, do you remember what it was like, you know, that they're, they're, you know, they're kind of like this and that they're on the coffee table and you know what walking is? Walking is moving out of your comfort zone and get ready to fall and catching yourself just in before you fall, and then getting out of your comfort zone and running to fall again, and and then you do it again. And it's amazing. It's an off balance out of where you were from comfort to a moment of fearful indecision. Now, with practice, let me show you something. It can be done like this eventually. (laughs) But when your little kids fell down and they took two steps, what did you do? That was so good. That was so good. That was so good. Did you focus on their falling down or the few steps they took? Could I tell you the Apostle Paul said, walk in a manner worthy because he wants you to know that the Father and God, he rejoices at your steps of faith and he's not shocked when you fall down. And because we've created this pseudo culture of Christianity, the great majority of us spend half our energy trying to hide when we fall down. And what we really need to do is realize God is cheering for every step of faith. And we need to be in that cocoon of community where we can be loved through that journey and process. But you have to learn. You have to learn how to, I call it, appropriate grace. You have to learn how do you allow Christ to live his life through you? Uh, on the very back, you don't have to look now, I put a series of very specific resources that you can check out. And I'd encourage you, I mean, we're going to go on a journey. This isn't like, oh, we're doing a series. This is like, how are you going to live the rest of your life? The second reason we fail to be transformed is spiritual isolation. Our failure to actively, notice that's the key word, actively participate in deep, Christ-centered, honest relationships makes transformation impossible. The problem, and please don't feel too bad about this one, but it's pride. I I don't mean necessarily just the pride where you stick out your chest and you think, it's the pride of self-dependency. Because if you don't have deep, authentic relationships, and whether that's in a small group or whether that's around the table in your family or with a couple guys or a couple gals or two or three couples, I'm not talking about just being in a small group. That, that's the container. I'm talking about really doing life authentically and openly and lovingly and people who know what's really going on. 
And you get accepted even when you blow it. And, and you get kind of kicked lovingly when you know you need kick because they really care. See, the reason we don't do that is my agenda is I think is more important than God's agenda. I mean, when you tell me we don't have time, well, well, just all I have to do is say, well, tell me what your schedule looks like. Well, I work, 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 and then we have youth sports, and then I have this, and then I have this hobby, and I work out, and you know, then I go to the gym, and then I, oh, okay. So all you're, all you're telling me is that matters more than what God says is the very place where he's going to transform you. At the end of the day, everyone does what matters most, period. We never have a time problem. All of us have priority issues. And for some of you, I mean, here's the application. I mean, it's very, very, very simple. The solution is do life in community. And for some, it's changing how life happens in your home. For others, you need to join a small group. I mean, we are off the charts on that because butterflies get transformed in cocoons. Christians get transformed in community. But there's a second application. It's not just join a group. It's get real in the group. And if you can't do it with the whole group, maybe there's a couple people or or even one or two you really get close to and you feel like, you know what, I could really do life at a deeper level with this person. uh, I'm pretty comfortable kind of sharing what's going on. I work with great people. Uh, My wife is very open and we can share things and But it's probably about three or four months ago as I was kind of looking at, okay, the next year and this next season and see what God's doing at the church. I see what he's doing at Living on the Edge. I kind of see these things bubbling up. You you know, when God starts to prick you and you realize, you know, I need to address some things and, well, who would I do that with? And I I have a friend that I've known for 30 years. We did ministry, I mean, when I was 28 years old and we, we were partners together in a ministry together in a church of about 35 in Texas. And we got to work for another 15 years later, and he's now a, a pastor. And, and we just tried to get on each other's schedule. And I remember realizing no one knows me on this entire planet better than him. I've got issues that could make or break what God wants to do in my life and through my life. And in my self-dependency and overscheduled arrogance, I've not taken advantage of that. And about three months ago, I asked if we could have breakfast, and it took us, you know, your schedules, three weeks to even get breakfast on one morning. And I asked, would you meet with me every other week? And he said, well, like, for what? I said, I, I, I need a place of someone who has all my history that I can be as honest with you as I am with Teresa. And I know God wants to do some things to take me to a level and, and I don't know where to go. I mean, I can go down to, you know, like a lot, of, pretty deep. But there's a lot of these people now, they, they think I'm way smarter than I am. They think I'm more holy than I am. And you know the truth of all of that, right? It's been 30 years. And the only way I could do it is, is, is on a day that I really wanted to reserve for other things. And every other week, we've been meeting. And we got done uh, this last week, early in the morning. He turned to me and we're finishing up at Starbucks, and he just looked at me, kind of his eyes wet and my eyes wet. He goes, man, I'm sure glad we're meeting again. I said, me too. D- do you have that? Uh, it's not going to be easy. It will cost something. But remember how we started the message? What's that one thing you'd really like to change about you? It's just reading the Bible more, coming to more services, There's got to be community at a deep level. The third reason we fail to transform is I I call it spiritual myopia. That's a word for nearsighted. In other words, we fail to see the big picture. The problem is our, our, our culture of consumerism. The solution is to get a high, holy view of God. And here, here's, all, here's all I want to say, and I'll try not to go off on this. I'm going to try and contain myself. The Christianity of the last 30 or so years in America or 40 that we've sent to the world 
is a consumeristic, God is my cosmic vending machine, Jesus is my personal trainer, self-help guru, and the whole goal of the Christian life is that am I happy, am I fulfilled, do I have a great marriage, have I found the right person, do my kids all turn out right, are we upwardly mobile, you know, am I healthy, wealthy, and everything going my way, and if not, Jesus, you're not coming through for me. When did you forget that I, this narcissistic, consumeristic Christian, have taken your word and made all of it about me, and you're supposed to make me happy and healthy and wealthy and wise and wonderful, and someday all my kids around the Thanksgiving table singing kumbaya, and everything turns out right. I never have a problem. Tragedy never happens. Cancer never happens. And if I really believe, then everything goes my way. And we've been exporting that stuff around the world. I got news for you. If he gives you a rich, deep marriage, if he gives you health, if he prospers your business, if your kids grow up and love God, all those are really wonderful, wonderful byproducts. But I will tell you, Christians living like Christians are the acid test of whether God sent his son. There is one spirit, there is one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father over all. One, 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 all, all, all. And how we live or don't live says to the world, God is really God, Jesus is the Savior, and when we don't live like Christians, your happiness and my happiness and our fulfillment is very secondary. He's the creator, it's about him, he has an agenda, and we sign up to say, how can I serve you, O Lord and Master and Creator, who is worthy of glory and honor and power, for you have created all things, and by you all things have created, and in and by you they have their being. And we are finite little people in this teeny, teeny thing called time, and time will go away, and there'll be all eternity, and we will worship a living God in a new heaven and a new earth, and what we do now matters for that and forever. And he calls us to live those kind of lives. And like you, I'm inundated. I mean, if you thought, where did he get that rant and rave about, I've done that. We've had cancer in our house. I've had struggles with my kids. Things have gone wrong. And I find myself starting to whine instead of, well, wait a second. The Bible says that's, those are all the things that are going to help change me. I don't like them. But is God good or not? Is God sovereign or not? Is God in control or not? Is he the center or am I?